Yeah, thank you. I would like to also start thanking the organizers, and in particular, Eddie, for inviting me to this wonderful place. And if, you, if I can have the first slide. So I'm going to concentrate on a specific type of uh, stress tolerance, and that has to do with um, uh, the case of desiccation tolerance. So the desiccation tolerance is an adaptive trait that has evolved independently several times during evolution. So there are, for instance, small animals and insects like Artemia salina, uh, which eggs can be viable more than 10 years in a desiccated state. There are also these uh, little water bears which seem to be quite resilient to all sorts of stresses. They can even survive when they take them from the space and station out, and they bring them back, and they are still alive. And they can survive over 50 years in the desiccated state. So when you rehydrate these animals, they become active again, and they reproduce. But probably the most spectacular case of desiccation tolerance is in plants. So in plants we have, if I can have this video please, these are uh, resurrection plants. These plants can be completely dried for months, years, and when rain comes, they start to come back to life. It's not that a new plant emerges, but the desiccated tissue becomes photosynthetically active again and metabolism activates and then the plant continues to live. So this is the, the timing, accelerated time, so this is three hours, four hours, five hours, six, seven, eight. Within 10 hours, all the photosynthetic apparatus and all the metabolism of the plant becomes normal again. So this is a, a fantastic uh, trait that has evolved in plants. But perhaps the most spectacular flavor of this desiccation tolerance is desiccation tolerance in plant seeds. As you know, in the seed, there is an embryo which is desiccated, and upon imbibition, it gets water and the plant germinates again. So this is seeds that were rescued from a herbarium in Iran. Uh, they are 150 years old. Some Swedish scientists took them to Sweden. They watered them and the seed is still viable. These are 1,300 year old lotus seeds rescued from a Chinese thumb. And when you water them, they are still alive. And in fact, a very spectacular thing here is that the morphology of the leaf of these plants is already slightly different from other lotus plants. So we can already see some life evolution. And the most uh, extreme documented case, because there are some others which are not well documented, is these date seeds that uh, were rescued from an Egyptian thumb. And again, you plant the seed on soil and the plant comes back. So the wonder is how the plant manages to protect the embryo for such a long time from maintaining the structure of membranes, proteins, RNA, and DNA, particular DNA, because DNA becomes hydrolyzed by chemical reaction. It's not only uh, biological reactions, but in the presence of slight amounts of water, DNA hydrolyzes spontaneously by different mechanisms. 
So how does a seed protect the embryo to survive for over 2,000 years? There is a case of 20,000 years, all that were rescued, but those are not uh, well documented to see if it's true or not. So how does desiccation tolerance evolve during plant evolution? So as you, as you know, plants derive from aquatic algae. And when algae started to conquer land and primitive plants started to conquer land, they had to withstand longer and longer periods of dryness when they started to go away from the edge of the lake or the edge of the sea. So they had to, to evolve desiccation tolerance and other traits in order to survive. So they, they evolved desiccation trait, uh, desiccation tolerance, and most primitive plants like bryophytes and lycophytes, they are all vegetatively desiccation tolerance. That means that the plant can dry out and activate itself. They also had to develop roots, root systems, to be able to extract water and minerals, minerals from the soil. And in fact, there is a very interesting symbiotic association here that uh, uh, plants develop an association with fungi that allows them to take up phosphate from the soil, which is one of the most ancient in symbiosis in, in plants. So this is a, an interesting case, and what got me interested in this, in this, in the study of this uh, process, which is quite complex because we need to protect many different types of molecules and, and be able to reactivate the embryo after a long time, is that, as I said before, uh, the most ancient plant lineages were all desiccation tolerant in the vegetative tissues. But then, when vascular tissues evolve in plants, plants lost the capacity to, to, to tolerate desiccation in vegetative tissues, and the desiccation tolerance migrated to the seed. So apparently, the mechanism that was regulating desiccation tolerance in the, in the vegetative tissues was rewired in order to function in the seed. And that's why one of the, the potential explanations as to why angiosperms have conquered every single ecosystem in the world. That's one of the components that, of Darwin's concept of the abominable mystery of angiosperms, because they are present everywhere. And the reason is that the seed can stay there even if the, the proper conditions to germinate and grow are very short. So the, the, the seed withstands everything, cold, heat, dryness, and then it germinates and produces more seed. So if this is what happened, the, the other interesting thing in this process is that, it doesn't work anymore, ah. that after vegetative desiccation was lost in plant lineages, it has re-evolved or reappeared again in vegetative tissues at least nine times independently in angiosperms. So the switch moved from vegetative tissues to seeds and from seeds back to vegetative tissues. So that suggests that although this is a very complex process, it must be orchestrated by a discrete number of controlling genes, namely transcription factors. So what we wanted to do is try to address this problem and, and try to understand what is the circuit that regulates the activation of desiccation tolerance in plant seeds. So how does desiccation tolerance is acquired during seed development? So first, you have a process in which the embryo after fertilization, start to undergo cell divisions and cell differentiations until a proper embryo is developed. So during this period, there is 100% of moisture. When the embryo, is, embryo has been developed, it starts to lose water, 
and accumulate reserve compounds. That means oil and proteins that will be used as energy sources when the plant germinates. After a certain moment of losing water, then the mechanism of desiccation tolerance is activated. And then a very rapid loss of water happens and the seed enters into dormancy until water is applied again to the seed. So there are a number of uh, mutants which are very interested in, 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 in plants, in Arabidopsis, the model system that we use. These were already discovered uh, in, in the early 1980s because people was interested in identifying genes that were essential for embryo viability. So what they did, they mutagenized the plants and they recovered the seeds and they rescued seeds that were not able to germinate. So they were called embryolita. But among these mutants, there were some of them that if you collected the seed before it, it got dried, it was perfectly viable. So there was no defect in the embryo, but they actually lost the capacity to tolerate desiccation. So these mutants are, are quite pleiotropic, and what happens is that they, they lost the capacity to tolerate desiccation, and when the embryo is forming, it directly transits to vegetative growth. So it doesn't enter dormancy and it doesn't dry the embryo, it rather directly enters into seedling growth. So that's why they are so, so, so pleiotropic. And the interesting thing is that there are mutants which have the same phenotype that they transit into uh, seedling growth, but they maintain desiccation tolerance. So what we figure out is that we, if we did a, a transcriptomic and metabolomic analysis of these mutants, we could identify the genes that were not activated or the compounds that were not produced in the mutants that do not longer tolerate desiccation. So this is the type of mutants we, we analyze, for instance, leg one and leg two, they have very similar phenotypes. They accumulate chlorophyll in the dry seed, which normally is not happening in the wild type. It accumulates anthocyanin in the cotyledons, in both of them, but the, the wild type doesn't accumulate. The, the accumulation of storage compounds, storage proteins, is normal in the wild type, but it's reduced in these two mutants. The production of ectopic trichomes, trichomes are like hairs on the leaves, which suggests that they are true leaves now. They are producing both mutants and not in the wild type. And the only difference they have is that one is desiccation tolerant and the other is not desiccation tolerant. So what we wanted to do is to make a comparison at different time points during seed development to test what were the differences in, in transcripts that were being produced and metabolites that were produced. So we, we selected three time points, 15 days after fertilization, 17 days and 25 days, because at 15 days the, the, the seeds have 100% water, and 17 days they have lost 40% of the water, and, and 21 days they have lost all the water they have to lose. And then we, we made a comparison between these tolerant and intolerant mutants to desiccation. So uh, this is a heat map showing what happens in the, in the mutants compared to a wild type. So there are a number of genes which are activated in both types of mutants respect to the wild type. These genes have to do with this transition to vegetative growth so that the, 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 the embryo accumulates chlorophyll and anthocyanins, it activates sucrose biosynthesis. So all these genes have to do with this process. And we were interested in these genes, which are not activated only in desiccation uh, intolerant mutants, but they are activated in the, in the desiccation tolerant mutants and in the wild type. So these, these genes, it was the set of genes that we were searching for. So when we did an analysis of what these genes were, as I mentioned before, the ones that are activated in the mutants have to do with uh, uh, seedling growth, like photosynthesis, sucrose synthesis, cell division and expansion, and so on. 
In the case of the genes that are not activated, most of them have to do with the stress protection. So in, in plants, we have this type of late embryogenesis uh, proteins, which are proteins that protect other enzymes from uh, uh, misfolding and from uh, uh, stop functioning. The synthesis of oligosaccharides, because we know that there are some oligosaccharides that have a very strong protective effect against uh, the loss of water. So now we had a set of about uh, 500 genes that were not activated in the desiccation intolerant mutants, but we wanted to know what organizes the expression of these genes. So to, to understand this part, we had to build a co-expression network based on mutual information to see how all these genes organize themselves into a network. All the genes that are expressed in the seeds are present here. And we have transcription factors, and we have effector genes and, and enzymes and everything. So in this network, we localize the transcription factors that are not activated in the desiccation intolerant mutants. And we found that there are two subnetworks of transcription factors that fail to be activated in the desiccation intolerant mutants. These two subnetworks, of course, regulate the expression of many genes. These red uh, nodes are the transcription factors that are regulating the expression of many genes. So the subnetwork one that we identified controls the accumulation of storage compounds and part of the genes related to stress. The second subnetwork regulates the expression mainly of genes related to stress. The LIA proteins that I mentioned before, heat shock proteins, the accumulation of oligosaccharides, and the expression of many enzymes involved of reactive oxygen species scavenging. These networks evolve during seed development. So for instance, this is subnetwork one, which has at the beginning when there is still 100% water, only one component which is maintained in the next two steps. The other subnetwork is only activated when the seed has already lost some, some uh, water. And it also evolves and recruits more nodes to regulate all the genes that it has to regulate. So here the question is if this is all computational biology. So I have genes that are expressed, not expressed. I made a network, but now we have to show that this is indeed biologically significant. So if these nodes do indeed regulate the expression of desiccation tolerance genes, and if you mutate them, desiccation tolerance has to partially decrease in the seed because these nodes regulate only a subset of the genes involved in the process. So these are mutants in some of these transcription factors. And as you can see, they all lose viability when they are desiccated in comparison to the wild type. Moreover, if this is really a network, double and triple mutants should be even more sensitive than the single mutants. And that's what it happens. If you have a double mutant or a triple mutant, then you reduce seed viability even more suggesting that indeed these nodes, these transcription factors work in a network regulating all the components that are required to acquire uh, desiccation tolerance. If these transcription factors indeed regulate genes that have some protective activity, if I activate one of these transcription factors in a mutant which is totally desiccation sensitive, I should recover partially seed viability. And that's what happens. This is a wild type seed, 100% regermination after desiccation. This is a, a mutant, which is desiccation intolerant, is 100% lethal. And you see if I explain one or the other or 
different transcription factors involved in these subnetworks, I rescue partially seed viability. The, the plants are not as happy as these ones, but they are able to germinate, suggesting that we recover some of the, of the desiccation tolerance. Another way to demonstrate that these nodes regulate the expression of many genes is that if we overexpress this transcription factor in the desiccation intolerant mutant, we can see that it activates the expression of these genes which are not active in the, in the mutant. So suggesting that indeed this expression of this transcription factor is regulating the genes that are apparently or, 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 or theoretically on, under its control. So based on this, uh, we have built a network. These are the master genes from which we started, but these genes regulate many processes during seed formation. And in part, they regulate through these networks that we discover the, the tolerance to, to desiccation. Now what we want to do is to, be, to test whether we can by genetic engineering, re-evolve desiccation tolerant in vegetative tissues. So try to imitate what has happened during evolution in the lab. So what, what, what we want to do is express these transcription factors now in the leaves of the plant and see whether we rescue some of the desiccation tolerant properties. So we have done a very complex <laughs> engineering process to express individually one of each of the major nodes of these two subnetworks. Combinations of two, if they are related in the, in the set of genes that they co-regulate. Three genes, if they are three nodes that are working together. Four genes, to have a complete subnetwork, another four genes, so we have this. And finally, express nine transcription factors at the same time. I cannot give you the final result because we haven't finished with the, with the work so far, but the results are promising. So how do we do these experiments? We germinate the, 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 the seeds, we transfer after 14 days of growth into a, a pot with soil. We keep the, 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 the plants growing under full irrigation for 10 days, and then we stop watering. We stop watering for different amount of times, and then after a given number of days in which we don't water the plant, we apply water again and see how many plants recover growth after rewatering. And that's what we assess as the percentage of plants that survive uh, this uh, water withholding. So at the beginning, it was not very encouraging because we, if we express one of the transcription factors, this is the, 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 the plants before stopping watering, and this is after the irrigation recovery. So if you see the wild type, most of them, they are dead. And there are a few plants in this line that is expressing one of the transcription factors, but nothing really to, 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 to die about. This is another different transcription factor. There are a couple of plants growing here, but not very different from the wild type. What we notice is that when you get to three different transcription factors, then you really notice the difference. So these are the plants after 14 days without watering. They look more or less dead. If you rewater the wild type, it is indeed dead. It doesn't recover. But this plant expressing three of the different transcription factors recovers quite well. Almost 100% recovery. This is a still not desiccation tolerance because if we stop watering these plants not for 14 days, but for 30 days, they die. So we hope that when we get eight transcription factors expressed in the leaves of these plants, then they will have more or less desiccation tolerance 
in, in a similar way than, than normal plants that are desiccation tolerance. So this is um, what I wanted to do. The work was done um, by Sandra Gonzalez and Thelma Rico with the help of Gerardo. These are two graduate students and she did just finish her PhD and published this work uh, a few months ago. Thank you very much.